this is Chris Albert, and I'm here to remind you of one thing. Someday, you're going to die. Now, that's not some morbid statement or scary idea. It's solid fact. Your time here on this earth is limited. And we need to be reminded of this as much as possible for one simple reason. To live your best life while you can. This is the Warrior Soul Podcast. What is going on, everybody? Welcome to this edition of the Warrior Soul Podcast. My name is Chris Albert, and we've got an amazing interview for you today with an awesome trainer, one of the best trainers in the world, according to Men's Health, Mr. Bobby Maximus. Bobby's the author of a book called Maximus Body. He's also been an elite trainer to tier one special operators, professional athletes, and a lot of other elite clients, but he's also worked with average everyday people just seeking to become better versions of themselves. Bobby's style of training is very hard. And if you follow him over on Instagram, you see him deadlifting hundreds and hundreds of pounds, like upwards of 600, 700 pounds. You see him rolling jujitsu. You see him doing lots and lots of Metcon stuff. And it's really awesome to watch him on social media. He's super inspiring. Bobby's also been a UFC fighter, he was a police officer, and he was a teacher at one point in time. And we get into what led Bobby toward training as a career. Bobby's also a really avid jiu-jitsu practitioner, and he's been competing at the highest levels, and we talk about how jiu-jitsu fits into his training. We also talk about the fact that Bobby's been struggling with a case of C. diff and a severe case of ulcerative colitis over the past few months, and that's something that I've struggled with myself over the past, and we get into that in a bit of detail and things that you should be doing if you find your life life is heading down a path that's a little bit dark. Bobby's been able to keep a really positive mindset about everything that he's been going through, whether it's been in business or in life. He's also a really dedicated father and he's very dedicated to his wife and his children. And we talk about why it's important to him to be able to be around for his kids and to provide for his kids. It's a really awesome interview. I know you're going to get a whole heck of a lot out of it and we'll have every way to contact Bobby and order his book up on the show notes for today's episode. If you haven't been to the Warrior Soul podcast, if you haven't listened to the Warrior Soul podcast before, again, my name is Chris Albert, and this podcast is dedicated to helping U.S. military veterans to live their best lives. The reason why I put this podcast together is because over the past decade and a half, The U.S. military veteran community has seen a lot in terms of really high veteran suicide rates, really high rates of chronic disease and mental illness, and a really high rate of veteran homelessness. And the thing is, we've seen a lot of people trying to raise awareness about these issues, talking about these issues, but very few people actually delivering real solutions. And so the goal of each and every episode that we do is to deliver an actionable piece of advice to you that you can implement directly after the show. If you're not a veteran, you can still get a lot out of these episodes and everything we do is meant to help anybody who listens to live their best lives. We just focus on the U.S. military veteran community because that's where I come from. I'm a U.S. Marine Corps veteran and uh, that's where it's really needed right now because we have a lot of people within the veteran community who need to push their lives forward. And it's my true belief that the veteran community is the sleeping giant in this country and that once they wake up, they're going to be able to have a major impact on this country's future, its direction, and its success. Beyond that, I also want to mention that this podcast is brought to you by F-Bomb Nutrition. The show could not happen without them. They are absolutely awesome and they make awesome, delicious portable packets of fats. I'm a huge fan of their macadamia nut butters. They mix them up with chocolate. They mix them up with sea salt. They mix them up with pecan butter and coconut butter. And they're so delicious. There's no sugar in them at all. And they give you a really awesome source of healthy fats that you can carry around with you anywhere without a mess. 
They're also awesome people, and they've been sending packs of this stuff overseas to the troops on the front lines, and just a really great group. Uh, if you're looking to try F-bombs out and you want to get 20% off of your first order, you can head over to www.dropinfbomb.com and you can use the code WARRIORSOUL at checkout and you'll get your 20% off of your first order. With that, I'm going to stop yapping my gums right now and we can get into this conversation with Master Trainer, Mr. Bobby Maximus. What's going on, Bobby? How you doing, man? Hey, good. How are you? Thanks for having me on your show. Absolutely. It's my pleasure. It's my pleasure. Uh, so legend has it, you were born in the great white north of Canada and you were raised by polar bears. Uh, and you came down and uh, uh, with, uh, with all the storm of a, of a great white northman and you started fighting grizzly bears. This is true. Most of it's true. Most <laughs> No, seriously, I, you know, I, I've been a big fan of yours for a while. Um, you've got a really interesting background and, um, we've got some similarities in our background. Uh, I was a trainer for a while. I founded a gym called Metroflex gym in Long Beach, and we've both been affected by, uh, ulcerative colitis and C. difficile. So, uh, definitely a lot to talk about here. Um, first things first, Bobby, you know, uh, you have this saying every damn day. What does that mean? You know, for me, it means improving yourself every day. Um, a lot of people think that I train every day. And I mean, th that's kind of true. I do train on most days. But what the saying really means is I do something to improve myself every day. And it's not just limited to physicality. It could be something emotionally. It could be spiritually. It could be psychologically. But I think the goal as a human being is to always be better tomorrow than you were today, to always strive for improvement in some way. So every damn day. I, I wake up and I look for some way to improve myself. And that could be training in the gym or it could be reading a book, whatever, whatever I think needs to be done to be a better person. And yeah, so I, I, I definitely agree with you there. I think that, you know, we've all got to be doing something when, you, when you're not in the gym, you said you're reading books, you're, you're doing other things to try to improve yourself. What type of stuff are you looking to read? What type of stuff do you focus on? You know, a lot of time right now, uh, actually, a lot of people don't know about this. I had an English degree in university, so I read a lot of books. I did a course in Shakespeare and drama, did a course in romantic literature, Renaissance literature. I, I basically read every, if there's that list of 100 classic novels that everyone should read at some point in their life, I've read them all. Um, so I tend to stay away from stuff like that right now because I've read so much of it. A lot of the stuff I read right now is actually not book based, but most of it's on the internet and most of it's learning. And a lot of it right now has been centered on bettering my business, being yep. better at Instagram, being better at, at digital marketing, because that's a big part of my platform. And if I want to help as many people as possible, I, I've got to learn that stuff because I, frankly, I can't afford to hire somebody for it. Yeah. There's so much stuff out there that you can do. And for those of you at home, uh, Bobby's got little Maximus right there with him. Uh, and, uh, that's who you hear in the background. Um, Bobby's also a, a dad. And, um, like I said, he's got a really interesting background. You've been a, you've been a teacher, you've been a police officer, you're a martial artist and, and you've been in the UFC, right? Yeah, that's correct. I mean, I've done, I've done a lot of stuff. I always tell people with training, I'm overeducated and underqualified mm -hmm. for my job. Um, I've got three university degrees, a uh, Bachelor of Arts in Psychology, a Bachelor of Arts in English, a Bachelor of Education. From there, I taught a little bit, went on to be a police officer, fought in the UFC, and then got into the training industry because at some, somewhere along the line, I learned that people, one of the main tools to make people better is using their body. That through hard work in the gym, through transforming your body, you can change your mind. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a very uh, powerful way to change somebody from the inside out to really re like re hardwire, if you will, their psychology. And so that's why I ended up in, um, in training and, and along the way, I mean, frankly, it's allowed me to do a bunch of things too. When I, you know, you mentioned having my son, I consider it such a, like a, a privilege or a, a privilege is the wrong word. Uh, really I'm grateful and I'm fortunate to be able to spend time in the day with my kid. And it's funny because my kids have been to military seminars with me. 
Mm-hmm. They've been to public seminars with me. Uh, I do podcasts with them around. I mean, I'm a very involved dad. And as a police officer pushing a scout car around for 12 to 14 hours a day, I'd never see them. And so I'm very, very grateful being on the other side of the fence to have this time with them. That's that's so important, you know, gratitude in every every type of situation, because, you know, no matter what you've got going on for you, you, you need to find some sort of gratitude for what you're doing right now and, and what you've got in your life. And I know a lot of entrepreneurs, they're 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 home based entrepreneurs and they complain about having their kids around. They complain about having having the little guys around. And, and I think that perspective is so much better than than than, you know, just complaining and thinking of it as a limitation. Yeah. And I think people complain to complain sometimes. Nothing's ever good enough for people. Everyone's got an issue with something, but part of that is we also conform to society's expectations. Um, You know, I'm, uh, and I think part of it's being upfront with what you want and what your demands are and being true to yourself. And to give you an example of that, um, a friend of mine actually was really interesting on her Instagram. Her name is Melissa Hartwig was talking about drinking and how you should address if someone wants you to drink and you don't want to drink Mm -hmm. and her point was to just say, no, thank you. I don't drink and end it at that. Too many people make excuses like, Oh, I'm driving. Um, I have to work out tomorrow. And and what you're doing is you're weakening your argument in a way because you're making an excuse when you're not doing anything wrong. And so to relate that to being a dad in the day, there's absolutely nothing wrong with me taking my kid to work. Right. And if somebody has a problem with that, don't hire me. Like I'm very upfront about it that I'm an involved dad. It's very important for me to spend time with my kids and my wife. And I want to, one of my main goals on this earth is to raise a better generation of human. So if you, if you can't understand that the problem's not me, the problem's you. And I'm very forceful with that. I find that people start to listen to other people. Like someone would say to you, how can you work at home with your kids? And you start to let that get inside your head start to take on other people's expectations. I, I know what's right. I know what I want to do and I stick to it. That's a, that's a big thing as far as separating what gets put in your head by other people versus what you really want and what your thoughts are. Do you, do you include like a meditation practice or a, a, a journaling practice or anything like that to kind of sort that stuff out? You know, I do, but in a weird way. So it's, it's funny when people think meditation, and this is me, I'm a hard headed kid from Canada, Northern Canada where it's very, very blue collar and you're not necessarily tolerant to these, I'm going to call it weird things, but like acupuncture, meditation, breathing exercises, things like that. But along the way, I learned how important it was. And working with my sports psychologist, I learned that the 10 words that will damage you the most are what will other people say and what will other people think. And that stuff can really affect you in a negative way. So the way I meditate now, I don't cross my legs and sit with, you know, my hands like this and chant and stuff like that in the middle of the darkness or or, or the living room. Uh, The sauna for me has become my meditation time. Uh, I'm in the sauna from somewhere between a half hour to an hour a day, close the door, and I'm in there by myself. And it gives me a lot of time to think. And so that's where I process everything that's happened in the day and try to work through it in my mind. And it really, really helps. Um, and I do forms of meditation, visualization, things like that to help either prepare me for a situation I'm going to encounter or to do some type of reflection on something that's happened earlier in the day. But it's, but it's interesting when we talk about people putting stuff on you because it's, you know, your life right now, you could be completely 100% happy with it. You could be fulfilled and you could be content. We don't talk about contentness as a thing, but being content, I think is one of the most important tools or important keys to your own happiness and you're completely content till one person points out something wrong with your life or one person says something to you and then you can switch in a day and all of a sudden be miserable it's interesting to see the parallels between what you're saying right now and your training because you know i've heard you talk before about your training and you say that, that there's a point in the workout every workout where this voice comes up in your head and tells you to stop right? It says, give up right now. And you got to really fight that voice that's going on there. And, and do you think that that's helped you with your personal success? And, and, uh, well, it definitely probably has, but how have you, how have you been able to cope with that? And how have you taught others to be able to cope with that voice telling them to, uh, give up there? 
You know, the, the, the big thing with that is I think facing those situations in the gym help you face them in life because the tools are the same. Overcoming a challenge that you don't think you can overcome, if you do that, you learn some sort of skill that transfers over to every other area of your life. But the big thing is, and I've been talking about this a lot lately, it's controlling the narrative in your head. Things are only as hard as you want to make them. And to give you an example of that, you can come to my garage and we can work out and you can choose to feel like you're going to die, to feel like you're suffering, to talk about how hard it was in this crucible you went through. Or you can look at it the other way and you're pretty damn lucky that you could afford a flight to Salt Lake City, stay in a nice hotel, come and train with it. You know, if I pump my tires a little bit, one of the best trainers in the world in a nice facility, please tell me how that suffering or that's really hard. There's a ton of people in this world that would kill for that opportunity. So how you want to choose to look at that situation, that's completely 100% up to you. And those are the type of lessons I want people to learn through training. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, I come from a, a bodybuilding training background and I used to coach a lot of professional bodybuilders and, you know, you go through Instagram, especially in that realm of fitness and you see people talking about going to war with the weights and going to war with, with the gym and all these things like that. And it's like, you're lifting inanimate objects in an air conditioned facility. You're not really going to war. You're not really suffering. It's a great pleasure to be able to do what you're doing and have the time to do it. So, so be grateful for that. Well, it's funny too. One of the terms that I have a love hate relationship with, and I'll, I'll, you know, start this off by saying sometimes I use this term and that makes me <laughs> angry that I use it. But when people are like rise and grind, wake up and if it's such a grind, why are you doing it? Because mm-hmm. it's a choice. Like shut up and get to work. And it's funny because you mentioned uh, Metroflex. Yeah. It's funny. Like I'm sure there were days that you were there that you wanted to burn the place to the ground. That you didn't want to be there anymore. That you were miserable. You're damn right about that. <laughs> but it's but it's funny because from my perspective, Metroflex is one of those world famous gyms that a lot of people want to make a pilgrimage to that they kill to be able to go there. And it's funny because you're sitting there complaining about it, but there's a whole lineup of people that would die to be in your spot. Right. And that's something I realized because, you know, you get up, you're a gym owner, you know, you get up every morning at 4 a.m., get, get the place open. You want to make sure the place is clean and organized for everybody to come in there. But like sometimes, you know, I would have these days where I'd look at people coming in and, and not appreciating equipment, not appreciating the place that I'd get down on myself. But then I'd look around and I'd look at the paintings, I'd look at the history and look at everything that was going on, on around there. And I would, um, you know, I, I'd be so appreciative of what happened there. And you really have to put yourself in that position. You know, I, and I can tell you years later, now that I've moved away and, and moved on to other things. I long for those days, those days when I yep. was in there at 4 a.m. and was dealing with the cold and gripping a cop, cup of coffee because it was my only source of uh, warmth, you know, and, and uh, I miss that. Well, and that's the thing. It's what you make of it, right? And so complain, don't complain. And that's the kind of stuff that I like. I try to hammer through to people in the gym using physical exercise as a tool. And those are the kind of lessons that I want people to learn through through training, through meditation, as, as, as you mentioned um, because I think too many people go through this life unhappy and honestly, flat out, just fucking ungrateful for what they have. Right. Right. And it's like walking around with blinders on because you can't ever fully appreciate what you've got going on and you can't be present in your life. And I think that's, what's important. You got to be present for what's going on. That's exactly it. You know, if I, if I look at my day, I can, again, I can paint it to you two ways. I had to do a podcast. I had to train people at Blender Bottle. I had to work out. I had, you know, there's another big part of me that's like, shut your mouth, dude. First of all, you're lucky that somebody cares enough about what you do to be on a podcast. So be humble and grateful. Number two, you're lucky you have a job because there's a lot of people that don't. And number three, part of your job is working out. Are you fucking kidding me? Mm-hmm. Cry me a river. Like, would you rather be in a cubicle all day? So let me, let me, let me get this right. You figured out a way to turn a hobby into a job and you're complaining about it. Yeah. That's like the kind of attitude that I've developed towards this stuff. 
Well, that's a, that's, that's amazing. And I think the more you translate that over to, to your followers and the people who you train, I think that the more you're going to be changing the world. What is your daily schedule? Like uh, how, what is it from, from wake up to till you go to bed? You know, uh, there's kind of two parts to my week. There's the weekdays and the weekend. On the weekdays, I actually train people at Blender Bottle. And for those of you guys that may not know or not realize, Blender Bottle is basically the shaker cup that every single worker outer in the world has ever had. I mean, God, how many of these have you owned? Millions of them. Um, I've, I've kind of partnered with them, and I train their employees in the morning. And so I wake up at about 5.30, uh, get to blender bottle at about six thirty. It's quite a drive for me, but I love working with them. It's a great company and it's a group of great people. Uh, train them for a couple of hours. Then I go to my own gym, Maximus gym. Uh, and that's actually a lot of morning, a lot of time in the car in the morning. I have a half hour drive to blender bottle in the morning, half hour drive back um, to the, to my gym. So about an hour in the car. Uh, then I train myself and my people. I have a group of people that I train in the morning along with uh, my head trainer at Maximus Jim Will Pace. Um, who's a, who's a great friend of mine and, and one of the best training partners I've had. We combine the session. So we always train with our people and lead by example. That's something that's super important to us at Maximus Jim. Uh, get done that around 11, go to jujitsu till 1230. Uh, then I come home and then I spend about four hours, uh, on the computer, but not really because I spend a lot of time with my kids. So if he naps, it's like hardcore computer time. Mm-hmm. He doesn't nap like yesterday. I'm a 40 year old child. I get distracted by He-Man and the masters of the universe, Thundercats, uh, legend of Zelda. We got into yesterday. It was an old school, um, video game, but they made a cartoon at one point and I had bought it and we watch it. Uh, we built some Legos. Um, then I work out again and then I spend some time with my family. That's awesome. That sounds like a great schedule. Um, yeah. And like I said, I could complain about it a million ways, but like, why I get to work from home, I get to train, I get to do these things. And yeah, there's things I don't like. I mean, nobody likes answering emails a day. Nobody likes constantly addressing stuff on Instagram. Well, I guess some people like it. Nobody likes um, business development and planning. Like I'm doing a certification seminar and yesterday we, uh, I planned the whole, you know, the whole syllabus and everything like that. Um, but I get a lot of work done and I get to work from home. So it's pretty damn good. And then the rest of the week, Friday, Saturday, Sundays, um, I don't have to go to the blender bottle. So those tend to be heavier computer days for me where I can really knock out some work. And so you've got to, like I said, you have an interesting path, you know, from, from, you know, being a teacher to, to being a, a police officer, to being in the UFC, to, to now, uh, being a strength and conditioning coach. Um, what turned you toward fitness? Was there a specific event or was there, was it somebody encouraging you to do it? Um, what, 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 cause a lot of people would say, Oh, he was a UFC fighter. So that's naturally why he would do it. But, but I don't see that. There's not a lot of UFC fighters who go into, into this field. So no. So- and to tell you the truth, um, I never wanted to be a UFC fighter. Like it was funny. I, uh, I was bullied pretty heavily till I was 15 years old and, I've got to say that with a grain of salt because I think every kid is bullied to a degree. Like everyone's been called the name. Everyone's been picked on. And I think sometimes people play the bully card too hard um, and use it as a crutch or use it as an excuse. But I remember days on the bus, I get punched in the face. Kids would draw on my face a marker. I get wedgied a lot. I'm like the king of receiving wedgies, I guess. Um, and when I was 15, these kids beat me up and broke my collarbone. And I never wanted that to happen again. So I started wrestling. Um, I sucked my first year. I didn't win a match. I was terrible. I was very ill suited for the sport. My second year, I won one match out of about 40. I probably had, um, maybe it was 30, maybe it was 50, but we would have these meets every week where you get three, four matches. And I only won one match this year, that year. And then I found the weight room and I was the person that got pinned literally under a 45 pound barbell. Mm. You know, my first day in the weight room had no clue what I was doing was very ill suited for that. But there was some people there who really helped me. Uh, Mr. Fox was one of the, one of the teachers who showed me some things. Brian Sapatelli was a teacher that showed me some things. There was this older kid 
Uh, his last name was Xavier. Can't remember his first name now, but he helped show me some things. And um, I started getting better and I started getting bigger and stronger. And then I started winning. Then I started to gain confidence as I won. And I'll always be grateful to wrestling and the weight room for transforming me into who I am today. And so I never really forgot that lesson. And that was probably the first time I was introduced to that tool of using physical exercise to make people better. Because frankly, I, would, I wouldn't be here if I didn't stumble upon wrestling in the weight room or frankly get beat up by those kids. Yeah. You know, you and I are the same age. And, and I remember back in the day, back in the 1990s, you know, everything was very influenced by bodybuilding and it was very influenced by like, you, you know, you had, that was back when like Vince McMahon had, had his bodybuilding federation. They had like Ico pro commercials all over the place. And there was a certain style of training. And I remember even when I joined the Marine Corps, that style of training was, was, all, was very prominent there. They had very bodybuilder style workouts and, and long, long distance running. But you're known for for a very different kind of training, and and uh, I know that you spent some time at Jim Jones, and and um, you you tra- trained a lot of tier one special operations or special operators. Um, how did you develop your your training style, your training mentality, and did you make a lot of mistakes along the way? Yeah, I mean, I was born at a bodybuilding. Listen, everyone who's forty years old is a bodybuilder. Yep, like. Growing up, you loved Arnold Schwarzenegger. You loved the Rambo movies. You loved like Dorian Yates is like a hero of mine watching him in the Olympia. Um, I used to have all of these books with Dave Draper, uh, Robbie Robinson, the Black Prince, uh, uh, Tom uh, Platt. Mike Metzger, Tom Platts, yeah. um, like all these people, right? They were all over my wall. Like just think old school muscle and fitness kind of stuff. Um, and I think one of the first training books I ever bought was Arnold Schwarzenegger's Encyclopedia of Bodybuilding, which I still think is the best training manual or training Bible out there. Um, but it doesn't relate necessarily to every task. And so I found as I kind of progressed in wrestling, that body weight stuff worked better than bodybuilding. So if you want to be a good wrestler, carrying people on your back, farmer carries, wedding carries, things like that work really, really well. Lifting odd shaped objects work really, really well. Doing some Olympic lifting and strongman lifts work really, really well. Burpees, I mean, shit, it's one of the best conditioning tools there are. And so as I got into wrestling and then ultimate fighting, I learned that there's this whole other world out there besides bodybuilding. Mm -hmm. Um, A lot of the stuff I learned there, I brought to Jim Jones. That was a gym I ran for nine, 10 years. I was, I was was brought there to turn it into, you know, what, what it ended up being. Um, and, And so a lot of those, those experiences I had through, wrestling and fighting I brought and and, and formed a huge basis of the training there. Um, But one of the things that's interesting, I've worked with probably every tier one asset in the United States military. And there's actually, and you'll remember this because you're old enough, there's a sharp divide in training. And I'm going to say there's like pre-911 and post-911. So pre-911, fitness in the military was bench press, maybe some leg press, looking big, looking good on the beach. Three-mile run, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, three-mile run maybe. And then all of a sudden, after nine one one, you're looking at ten k offsets at ten thousand feet of elevation. Bench press ain't helping you. And right. so I want to say that the body type really changed in the military too, where before nine one one, you had a bunch of big buff kind of kind of dudes that were looking to get big. And then the body type, like I, I done a lot of work with the Rangers, but the prototypical Ranger is five foot ten, five foot eleven, one hundred and eighty pounds. Yep. Because that's what it takes to be strong enough to carry shit and to be able to move 10 miles in the mountains or 10K in the mountains. And so um, there became a lot more of an endurance focus because that's what guys needed, frankly. Yeah, that's uh, that's something I, I realized when, um, you know, directly after I got stationed in, in Bahrain for a little bit and they had a SEAL team out there. And those guys were so big, so huge. Uh, yep. But it's, as an infantryman, I, I could never get that big. I could never pack on that amount of muscle because we're always out in the field and I was always super jealous of those guys. <laughs> yeah. 
but it also, but it also, that's not a good thing. I mean, if you think you're teamed with me and listen, I'm, I'm lighter now than I've been in a while. I'm only 238 pounds, but that's heavy. Mm -hmm. There's, there's another aspect to this. First of all, I can't move very well in the mountains. You put me at 10,000 feet elevation at my size and my muscle mass, I'm going to be in trouble. But the other thing that people don't think about is what if I go down and you've got to carry me? Mm -hmm. That's not good for the team. I mean, have you ever tried to carry a person who's 238 pounds a mile? It's yes, almost I have. Yeah. It's, it's rough. Not only that, because I'm the big guy, fuck it, I can carry it. I'm also not packing light. I'm carrying more than I probably should. I'm not. Well, now you're carrying all my shit too. So this becomes now, am I good for the team or bad for the team? Like, I mean, I'm the kind of guy that you want if you're going to kick in a door, mm -hmm. but moving around the mountains, probably not your number one pick. Right. So that's the other thing too, because how do I integrate into the team or integrate into uh, uh, the group? That's a big part of you know, fitness I teach. So when I do a lot of work with these tier one assets, that's a big part of what I teach is not just being fit in the gym, but truly being functional for your job and for those around you because it matters. Right, right. And, and the environment that you're in, that's a big one. Yep. Well, that's exactly it too, right? Because if you're sent to the city, that's one thing. You're sent to the mountains, that's another. Yep, yep. So you got to be flexible. Yep. With uh, with your own training, I know you're you're very focused on jujitsu right now. Um, how, what does your own programming look like, and and uh, how do you split it up? So for my own programming now, and understand, I wouldn't recommend to this everybody to everybody because I'm fucking crazy. That's part of it. There's a huge psychological part of training that for me, um, and I wish my kid had one. He just never used one. I was going to get a, like a pacifier to show you guys or a. Uh, what do they call it in the states? In Canada, we call it a suce, it's a French word for suck, but like a like a they call pinky. it like a, a sucky or a pacifier. Yeah. I was I was a pacifier kid. Yeah, w working out it's my binky, right? Like it's like it's my pacifier, it's my suce, it's like my 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 thing. And so I probably train more than I need to, to tell you the truth, because I just love it. It's also part of my business. It's how I generate content. Um, I use myself as a personal laboratory. If I'm training one of my guys in the NFL or NBA, I try stuff out of myself sometimes just so I know how it feels so I can relate to what they're going through. And again, I want to lead by example. I never put anyone through something I, I, I haven't done myself. So an example of that was a guy named Ronnie Price who's become a dear friend, played in the NBA for a number of years. When we started doing vertical training, and I say we because when he needed it, I started doing it because I wanted to do it with him. I wanted to understand how he felt, learn more. And I, I don't think there's a better way to learn than immersing yourself fully into something. So my training is kind of all over the place sometimes. But at a root level, a lot of people think that uh, being fit in the gym makes you fit for a fight. And that's just not true. It can be a contributor, but it's not the end all be all. And so really how my training's changed now is I used to do all kinds of intervals in the gym, circuits in the gym, chippers, uh, CrossFit type stuff, like what I call Metcon conditioning, uh, the other terms that people use for it, to breathe. Well, now I don't. Now most of my work in the gym is all lifting, jumping, and athleticism driven. And then I get my cardiovascular conditioning from actually doing the thing, and that's fighting. Yeah, that goes back to like Zatsiorski and, and, you know, focus on being strong first and get your conditioning from the sport you're focused on, right? That's exactly it. And I'm a big believer in that because I've met a lot of guys that do, you know, there's a guy that comes into our gym from CrossFit that he's, he has no gas rolling because he doesn't roll enough. Like what's better for you? Um, rowing 2000 meters for time. And I love that test or rolling for seven minutes with a person. Well, obviously you've got to get good at jujitsu specific conditioning. So my training right now, I train in the morning, like a kind of heavy lift. This morning I did some heavy deadlifts. Um, I do jujitsu at 11 every day. And then in the afternoon I do accessory type work. So today I'll do some stuff, uh, really big into the West side barbell stuff. Um, they become good friends. So I'll do some marching on my athletic training platform. Uh, I'll, I'll do some belt squats and I'll do some inverse curls or some people call them like Nordic curls or razor curls, or I'll do some of that. So I do my accessory work at night. 
That's awesome. That's awesome. That's a, that's a really awesome schedule too. Now, one thing about that, I probably could put my heavy lift and my accessory work together in one session, but I like working out twice a day. It's my pacifier. It gives me more content for my business. Um, And I also do feel from an intensity standpoint, there's only so long you can burn hot. So by working out in the morning, then doing the second half of my workout at night, I hit both with a greater intensity versus trying to fit it into two hours. But if I had to, I could, if that makes sense. That's, uh, you know, I, I definitely get that because I've, I've been a trainer for a while now and, and, you know, I understand that the content creation aspect of it. I also understand that, um, you know, splitting it up and make a lot of times it makes you feel better. It makes you feel better and in, in, in goes into the schedule a little bit better. Let oh, me ask you get a double, sorry, you get a double dose of those good chemicals too. Yep, the Every time chemicals. You, go out, you get more testosterone, more human growth hormone. I get a double dose of that, but it's kind of like for the old school bodybuilders out there. It's kind of like doing rather than doing buys and tries all at once. It's like doing biceps in the morning, triceps at night. Right. Right. And I, I that's something I definitely get to because as a home-based entrepreneur, like if I'm not moving around by noon, like I'm already getting antsy right now where I need to do something physical. Um, I, if I, if I wasn't training, I would be on some sort of drugs. I would be on methamphetamine or something like that. And, um, <clears throat> I'm definitely addicted to those chemicals. And, uh, I think a lot of guys who work from home, uh, if, if they're not, doing some sort of healthy activity a couple of times a day, then they find themselves falling into a lot of different types of traps. Yep. And that's, and that's the other thing too. I'm glad you mentioned being a home-based entrepreneur because for me, it's even a little different. It's like my workout at night. I mean, I got to work out in the morning to get moving, but like if I'm on the laptop or on the computer all day, I've got to move around like right. at the end of the day, because it helps me feel a lot better. Right. Um, let me ask you this. Uh, you know, you got into training, you were working with Jim Jones and, and, you know, now you've got your own gym. Um, number one, you know, what is social media taught you about marketing? Cause I, you've taken awesome advantage over Instagram. You, you've used it really, really well. Um, and two, uh, what's changed since you started your own gym? Um, what, what are the big things you're focused on right now? Okay, so with Instagram, it's actually interesting. I can tell you a couple of things I've learned and, and, a, and a couple of things that, have, um, th- th- that I've realized. First of all, Instagram's kind of a show. Like when you see Bobby Maximus on Instagram, you see me eat steak, you see me eat burgers, you see me be a dad, you see me work out with weights. And those are all things that are true. They're all things that are organic. There's nothing made up. It's who I am. But what people have to realize, it's not completely who I am. I'm showing you parts of Bobby Maximus. So if you think Bobby Maximus is this big circle, I'm showing you this much of it. I'm choosing what to show you. So a lot of people, I call Instagram the personal highlight reel. You might not see the ins and outs of my day, the emails I answer. Um, I don't post when I cut the lawn. I don't post when my basement floods and I've got to replace the flooring in the basement. I don't post when I'm having a bad day or I'm kind of sad. I mean, you only see a limited window into who I am. I don't post every TV show I watch. I don't post everything I drink or eat. And so it's very easy to look at a person's Instagram and think you know them, but you only know 25% of them or 30% of them. That's number one. Number two, it's a fuck ton of work. Yep. Like if you want to be good at it, it's funny. People get jealous. uh, They get upset. They, they, oh, you're so lucky of this many followers. Like why do people care about your, it's a lot of work. I answer every single comment. I answer DMs. I post content, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's a lot of work. On that note, could you push pause for one second, please? Absolutely. Thanks. We'll be right back. Yeah. Yeah. I'll be back. Yeah. So for those of you that may not realize because of editing or whatever, I had to just run to the bathroom. Um, and it's actually kind of funny because it's something I think that's important to talk about. And it's something that's like a big part of my brand lately. Um, and it ties in nicely to the Instagram. Um, about 10 months ago, I fell ill with this thing called Clostridium difficile. And I got really, really sick. Because of the filter that's on Instagram, I don't think people knew how sick I was. There's a couple of pictures I posted of the hospital. I posted that 
I lost 47 pounds in 30 days. I posted a picture of myself where I looked abnormally thin. I mean, I looked really sick. But what a lot of people don't get the messaging because I don't post every minute of my day, one out of five people die from what I had. I was left after that with a severe form of ulcerative colitis. Uh, there was a bunch of times they wanted to take my colon out. I told them no. Um, I was hospitalized. I mean, there were times, to be honest with you, I couldn't walk up the fucking stairs. I was so messed up. Um, and that's the stuff you don't see on Instagram all the time because it's not like I make it halfway up the stairs and have to sit down and collect myself before walking up the like the last five stairs. It's not like I post about that all the time because at the time, honestly, I felt like I was fighting my life. I didn't give a shit about posting at that point. But it's something that I wish I would have posted, if that makes sense, to give people like a real view. And lately, you know, Chris, I've been doing great. Uh, I'm 90%, I think. My weight's back up to 238. I can lift heavy, but you don't see the day-to-day struggles. And like, that's one of them. I had to pause this podcast and run to the bathroom. Yeah, and that's, I, that's the new normal right now. Like that happens at a podcast. It happens at weddings. It happens during movies. It like, I've almost had to change my life a little bit. I don't even like sitting in the movie theater anymore because I have to, at some point I might have to run out once or twice. And so you see the muscles, you see some good food, you see, uh, me living my life, but you don't see the inconvenience and like the struggle of that kind of stuff. And it's, it's, it's that's what doesn't get conveyed on Instagram. Yeah, I, I feel for you. I, I got diagnosed with uh, severe ulcerative colitis back in uh, 2011, and um, I'd been suffering from it for quite a while. And, uh, you know, at first when I got it, um, I thought I had cancer and it interrupted a lot. Like every, every, I couldn't train people in person anymore. I was, uh, I had to go to online training. That's one of the big reasons why I'm an online trainer today. Um, rather than taking people one-on-one is because for such a long time, I couldn't get through an entire training session without running to the bathroom. And that's me right now. Yep. Yeah. I, I, I definitely feel for you. Um, and, and, uh, I think a lot of people who don't experience that type of disease, um, have very little idea of the effect it can have on your life. And, you know, talking about like 20 to 30 bloody bowel movements a day, things like that. And, 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 um, you know, uh, a lot of people look at it and they'll say, well, you know, um, you look normal, you look, look like you're fine, but, but you know, at the end of the day, you're not, you know, and that would have been me. I totally would have judged before the say said, Oh, your widow belly hurts. Mm -hmm. That's sad, but no, it fucks you up. And the thing is, is like little things like, I don't know if I can, you know, I love going to my kids' football games. It's really hard to make it through a two hour football game sometimes. I'm always looking for a bathroom, looking for a, so that's the stuff that doesn't get put out on Instagram or can be edited away in a podcast that you just don't see. And this is true for everybody. Like you look at the rocks Instagram and I love the rock. I'm a huge fan of the man. And it's like, you see, Oh, he's so lucky. He has his own gym. He has his own jet. He has his, you don't see all the sacrifices and shit that guy's got to deal with on a day to day basis because he just doesn't post about it. And I don't want to post about it either. I don't want to read it. I don't want to read about negativity, but it's fucking hard sometimes. And so that's the, that's the, that's the, the dirty secret of Instagram. You don't see everything. Yeah. When, when you first came down with it, uh, what, what was the mindset there? What, what were you thinking about? You know, at first I was an ignorant bastard about it. Like I, I got this thing. I'm like, Oh, it's a stomach bacteria. It'll clear itself up. No big deal. Kept working out, kept doing my thing. Um, then I went to CT Fletcher's, um, which is actually close to Metroflex. And, uh, I went to his, his event, Iron Wars, uh, I used to three. be his nutrition coach back in the day. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I went, I went to um, Iron Wars 3, and uh, I really started feeling bad a couple of days before. And I was like, no, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. Um, lost a good half my strength. Uh, didn't do well at all. Like uh, There was like little minor in gym lifting competitions, but I mean, I went from benching 400 for reps to being barely able to lift 315. And um, just a mess. Got home uh, that day, went to the hospital, uh, was checked in, um, tons of bloody stool, 
uh, d- 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 diarrhea, um, massive gut pain, um, and, and understand that I'm not one to ever go to the hospital. Like I've done a lot of stupid stuff in my life, but I just don't go to the hospital. And then all of a sudden now these doctors are telling me this thing that I thought was a bacteria, how serious it is and how I might have toxic megacolon. And I'm like, what the fuck's that? Like, that sounds serious. And I was, well, we might have to remove it. And I was in all these tests and blah, 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 blah. And that's when I hit rock bottom. And that's when I lost 47 pounds in 30 days. And then I started realizing like, wow, I'm kind of in a fight for my life here a little bit. Like this is bad. Plus on top of that, lucky me, I don't get colds. I don't get the flu, but I've had MRSA twice. I've had staph. Like yeah. basically if there's a super bug, I'll fucking get it. <laughs> um, you put me in a room full of people with the flu, I'll be fine. You put me in a room with Ebola, I'm the only one that will get it kind of deal. Yeah. Uh, but I got an antibiotic resistant strain of C. diff too, so they couldn't treat it. So eventually I had to go for a fecal matter transplant to help clear it up. Um, but yeah, I was, I was a disaster. And then I just realized like, I might never be the same. Like I might not make it through this. If I make it through this, I might lose my colon, which is life changing. Like I might never fight again or do anything I love. And three, I might never be able to train. Like I want to train. Like, I don't know what this means. I, so I was dealing with a lot of that stuff as well. Did you change your nutrition? Um, and, and, and if you changed it, what, what guided you toward that change? You know, it's funny. I've actually changed a million small things, but haven't changed it as a whole. So to tell you kind of what happened, um, I, the clostridium difficile got cured with the fecal matter transplant. Um, basically no gut biome left at all. Like just a, like a vacuum. Um, and was still having a lot of symptoms. So I went in for a colonoscopy. They're like, wow, you have really bad ulcerative colitis now. And, I, and that's known if you have Clostridium difficile for that long. I mean, I fought that thing for five months. Mm. Uh, some people it clears up in five days and they're fine. But I was not one of those people. And so um, I had ulcerative colitis. And so the doctor said that diet doesn't play a role in it. I'm like, that's horseshit, dude. Yeah. Like, I know diet doesn't cause ulcerative colitis. Generally, it's stress-related stuff, but it can certainly help manage it, or it can set it off is probably a better way to look at it. So I started working with this company called Viome, who do a stool test, and and, and listen, I love it. I'm not paid by them, but I will endorse them till the day I die because they really turn my life around. Um, They do a stool sample, and they test your gut bacteria and make an individual recommendation list of foods for you to eat and stay away from. And, and I'm summarizing it here, by the way. But when I got the list of foods that I was to eat and stay away from, there were some things I was very happy with. I could have bone broth. I could mm-hmm. have steak. I could have chicken. I could have turkey. Like These are all things I love. But there's some stuff I had to stay away from too. Like oddly enough, cashews. Like whoever said cashews are unhealthy, they'd set me off. Broccoli would set me off. Um, blackberries set me off according to their tests. So it's weird because like before I would eat blackberries, now I have blueberries instead of blackberries because blueberries I'm supposed to eat. So I've changed a bunch of things like almonds instead of cashews, arugula instead of spinach, carrots instead of tomatoes. Um, Like I, I, but it's really not a whole scale life change because I'm still eating a lot of foods that I love. There's just foods I stay away from now and make slightly different choices and making those making 10 slightly different choices through the day has really, really helped me. Again, I'm not perfect. Mm -hmm. Like I had to run to the bathroom in this podcast. Um, There's times I'm uncomfortable. There's times I have good days and bad days, but now I win a lot more than I lose. If you know what I mean? Like there's some days I feel completely normal and good and sleep through the night. And then there's times where I've got gas and I've got to sleep in the basement by myself because my wife gets really upset with that. But, um, or there's times like where I'm a little uncomfortable or there's times I won't leave the house, mm-hmm. but those I might only have one day like that a month now versus being trapped in the house for six weeks straight. Yeah. It, it, and it's interesting because a lot of people they'll come into a diet and they'll think, Oh, this food is healthy or that food is healthy. Um, but a lot of times if, if you're in a situation like this, there is no such thing as a healthy or unhealthy food. There's a food that works with your system and then there's a food that doesn't. And, and well, that, that's exactly it, right? 
Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, uh, you know, I, I really applaud you for coming out like this. I mean, like a lot of people had, I mean, I had a really difficult time in working it into my own content when I was, when I was starting this. And then eventually it just got to the point where I was like, I don't give a fuck anymore. People got to know about it. And, and yep. I, I applaud you about this. Um, before we get off, cause I, I know we got to wrap up soon. I just want to talk about your book, Maximus Body, your, your gym, and and uh, a couple of things you got going on there. Um, first off, what made you write a book? You know, I thought it was the best way to help the most amount of people. Like, mm-hmm. I, I really, and, and take this for what it's worth, man, I, my goal, yes, I want to make some money. Yes, I want to be rich. Yes, I want to be financially independent. I want to, you can probably hear my little guy babbling in the background. He's a good little dude, but I don't want him to ever have to worry about anything. I don't have to put himself through school and I want to give him opportunities I didn't have. And um, so, so there's that part of it, but the other big part of it is I really want to help people. And, and how do you help people? Like how do you reach the biggest audience? And a book was a, a, an opportunity to do that. So to reach a bunch of people and it's crazy. I've got a ton of emails, a ton of DMS about how people's lives have been changed by the book how they become better dads. They've quit alcohol. Uh, they become a better wife. They've stopped with their self doubt. Like there's so many people that have been helped by this thing. It, it's, it's been amazing. That's awesome. And when you, um, you know, you said you're a gym, gym owner. Now you, you started Maximus gym. How long has that been going on? You know, since January, um, I left Jim Jones in November, mm-hmm. uh, took a month to kind of figure out, what I wanted to do, where I wanted my brand to go, all that kind of stuff. And the gym started up in, uh, in January. And you asked the question earlier, I mean, what's different, what's changed. The truth is now I can do what I really want. Like I, I have this, the culture I want to build is one of hard work, one of accountability, but also one of acceptance because I really believe that everyone deserves a chance to be fit that everyone deserves a chance for this to change your life. And so I also, I also want to, the culture I want is one that is not exclusive or not um, elite, if you will. I I, want to help as many people as possible, as long as they want to be helped. Um, You know, and and before we wrap up here, because I think, uh, you know, you've gone through a whole lot here, you know, a lot of the people who listen to this show, they're, they're combat veterans, U S army, U S Marine Corps, um, and, uh, a lot of them have been going through hard times themselves. And, and if you could sum up, you know, what, what would you say to those, the, those people out there who, who are going through these difficult times and, and they're, they're dealing with something in their life right now that needs to be fixed. What, what would you say? Well, to them? I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to ask you a question first to help me answer this. Who are the greatest two Marines of all time? Chesty number, Puller and Jim Number Matt. one. Yeah. Chesty Puller. Number one. That's obvious. Number two is I consider uh, Rob Jones, who's a very Rob good Jones. friend of mine. I don't know he's if you know a, him. He's been a guest on this podcast. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, great, incredible great guy. guy. Yeah. Legs blown off at Afghanistan. Um, came to me, wanted to learn how to row. Wrote him a training program. He got a rowing coach. Uh, ended up working with him, and he came third in the Paralympics. Mm-hmm. Calls me up one day. Hey, can you train me again? I'm moving to Salt Lake City with you. I want to ride my bike across the country. Cool. Ran 31 marathons in 31 days. Incredible guy. Um, the biggest lesson I've learned from Rob is here's a guy that has every reason in the world to be angry, to have a chip on his shoulder, to give up. To And he just loves his life. And he's got this slogan, life goes on. Like, I'm not special. I'm not unique. I was doing my job and this is who I am now. And it's incredible to me in the day of all these guys with PTSD and, uh, you know, that's a real thing. And I think a lot of people really suffer from it, but I also think at, at the risk of taking some backlash, I think some people use that as a crutch too. Like, I think people don't do the self work to get over it. And, um, Rob did, and he lives an incredible life and he's got quite a sense of humor too. Um, and he lives one of the fullest lives of anybody I know. And so one of the things like the piece of advice I, I give people again, it's controlling that narrative. Like what happens to you may not be a choice. How you deal with it and react to it is 100% a choice. And to give you like the kind of guy Rob is, he calls me up 
he goes, uh, Hey man, I was reading you at C diff. Like that's pretty bad. And I go, uh, yeah, Rob, like I, I'm, I'm not doing too well. You know me though. I'm okay. He goes to tell you the truth. He's like, I had that. He's like, if I could have the choice between C diff and get my legs blown off, he goes, I'd blow my legs off any day of the week. And I'm like, fuck you, Rob. <laughs> like, <that's, laughs> and he's laughing. He does a stand up comedy routine on stuff. Um, he, t- he told me once that I didn't know what to say. We were talking about uh, the military. I'm like, well, what was your specific job? And he goes, well, my job was to locate IEDs and landmines. And I go, oh, yeah. He goes, and guess what? I'm really fucking good at it. And I'm like, well, what, what am I supposed to say to that? Like, you, you, okay, Rob, you're cool. You set up the landmine. You're really good at your job. You found it. I get it. Ha ha. Good work. But He's just got such a good spirit about him and he's funny and he can make light of really a horrible situation. And so I've learned so much from him just in terms of, and I admire him just in terms of like, he just like zero fucks given. Do you know what I mean? Like just, and he's happy and it's hard. It's hard not to be, uh, it's hard to be around a guy like that and not, be more grateful and more humble and more happy because of his attitude. So that's what I I say to people like, be like Rob Jones. Like, yeah, yeah you, you take it on the chin, but get up and fucking do your thing and you can have an incredible life. Push through. And, and Rob, yep. Rob was a great guest and he, he, he's somebody that I admire a whole heck of a lot. Um, Bobby, how, how can people get in touch with you? Uh, your website, your Instagram, uh, any other social media handles? You know, the best ways, uh, bobbymaximus.com for my website. Uh, I'm always posting stuff on there at Bobby Maximus for Instagram. Instagram is my main hub or, you know, just Google Maximus body and get yourself the book. It really, I'm not trying to, well, yes, I am trying to sell it. Let's just be real. But, um, it's something I really believe in. And I think it's the best, I don't know what it's going for now. Amazon changes their prices up and down every day, but it's between the best 10 and $20 you will ever spend in your life. Awesome. Awesome. And we'll definitely get links to all those up on the show notes. And where is your gym located? It's in Salt Lake City. Um, I love it here. It's in the mountains, a beautiful area, really nice people. Uh, Couldn't be happier with it. So if you're out in the Salt Lake City area, definitely check out Maximus Gym as well. Uh, And to everybody out there, you know, Bobby, I, I want to thank you for coming on to this this episode, and and I, you know, I I really think it was a great interview, and and I really enjoyed talking to you, and I really enjoy your content and your inspiring message. Uh, no, and thank thank you for having me on, and thanks for bearing with my little guy and stuff. Like like I said, like it's it's so important to me to be involved with my kids, um, and to also like it's funny to have them involved in my world. Like it's 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 really interesting. My my older son. Uh, Landon is his, his government name, but no one calls him that. It's Beanie Maximus. Mm-hmm. He's been to a lot of military seminars. Like, it's funny. He's learned a lot from guys. He's learned a lot about sacrifice. He's met a bunch of incredible people. And, and, and um, it's super important to me how it's touched his life. And I wish more people would get their kids involved in what they do. Yeah. Because I think, you know, we have a whole generation of latchkey kids um, or, or kids that are raised by the TV. And I think it's super important to, model a good life for your kids. And, and, you know, like we talk about Rob Jones and I hate to go on and on about him, but he's so incredible. Like my sons have learned a lot from him. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Like, and, and some of it good, some of it not so good. Like when Rob told my kid that he, uh, killed Bumblebee from the transformers and stole his legs. I'm like, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> now my son believed that. And I'm like, all right, dude. So he's learned some not so good stuff, but that's another example how Rob Jones is just, he's, he's one of the funniest people I've met, you know, that's a Marine for you. That's a Marine. Uh, yep. Absolutely. Yeah. And I saw, I saw your son floss in. He's one of the best flossers in the world, uh, dancing up on the, on the- well, he can go, man. He, and you know what? He loves that. He dances. He helps other people. He, I got to tell you a funny story about him. I pick him up for school for lunch. I hadn't seen him in a week. I was doing some work with, uh, was six group in Florida. So I was down working with some special forces, people from the air force and uh, actually a couple of a couple ex Marines in there too, but um, working with them, didn't see him for nine or 10 days. So I came back uh, and got him from school at lunch and he comes out, he's red faced, he's sweating. Like, dude, what's going on? He goes, I just ran a mile. And I'm like, why are your clothes wet? He goes, well, I didn't change to my gym clothes. I go, why not? He goes, well, 
He goes, I can get a good enough time running in this. And he was in a cardigan, a tie. Didn't even unbutton his thing and dress shoes. And I'm like, what do you run it in? He goes, 712. And I go, is that as fast as you can go? He goes, no, dad, I think I can go sub six. But as long as I'm top five in the class, teacher doesn't care. Like, okay, that's the, uh, all right. I, 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 and then I started thinking, I don't know if I could beat this kid in a foot race right now. Which is funny. <laughs> um, but the fact that he's so into fitness and he wants to help other people and he, it, it's great, you know? That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, again, Bobby, thank you so much, man. You're an inspiration, uh, both as a trainer and as a father and, uh, to everybody out there listening right now, you know, pay attention to what Bobby said here, be grateful for the life you have, uh, aim for bigger things, but, but above all, you know, live your best life while you can. I mean, that's yeah, for sure. the essence of everything. So thanks again, Bobby. Hey, thank you. All right, guys, I just want to say thank you for listening to this episode with Mr. Bobby Maximus. I thought it was an absolutely outstanding interview, and I'm looking forward to having Bobby back on the show at some point in the future. Just a couple of notes here, a few things that you can get from this interview. Number one, gratitude. No matter where you are at in life, no matter what you're doing, you always have something to be grateful for. So like Bobby said, it really depends on how you're looking at your situations. You could either look at it like, oh God, I have to do this right now, or oh God, I have to go to work right now. Or you could look at it as, I have the privilege of doing this right now. I have the privilege of going to work and earning money in a time and place where a lot of people don't have jobs. So really try to frame things in a positive mindset. And if I were to say anything about this interview as to what to get from Bobby, in addition to the amazing training and nutrition advice that he has, it's this particular piece of mental strength that you can use to really improve your life and 10x everything you're doing. Again, we're going to have all the different ways to get in contact with Bobby, including ways of getting access to his book, Maximus Bobby, Maximus Body, up on the uh, the show notes for this episode. And I just want to encourage you guys, if you got something from this episode, if you felt like it was worth listening to, please Write us, a, write us a review up on iTunes. Uh, it really helps to spread word about the show. Share this show out with your friends, especially people who can use it. And like I said, get out there, put this advice to action, and live your best lives while you can. We'll be back at you very soon with another episode. Thank you so much.